Now we can start. Are we good? Come on. Okay. Anyway, good to see everybody. Um, again, we are in a really neat part of our study tonight. Our entire series is beginning to wind down a little bit as you look at your syllabus in your little book or wherever it is. Is it in the book? I don't think it is. Is it, George? That's okay. It shouldn't be. Um, let me show you real quick where we're at. Um, everybody look up here. We're at D6, the seven feasts of Israel. Um, again, I'll make a note because we're going to update this thing as we develop the book, but it should be, it should be termed the seven feasts of the Lord, as you'll see in uh, Leviticus 23 tonight. Take your Bibles and go ahead and turn with me there uh, real quick to Leviticus chapter 23, because this is a very significant chapter in your Bible um, that brings to light these seven feasts of Israel that we're going to look to at tonight, these seven feasts of the Lord. We're going to look at what they represent. Um, those of you that um, were around for Easter, I think I reminded everybody that a couple days before we celebrated Easter, I think it was on Friday, the 30th of uh, March, um, the Jews historically celebrated what we know as the Passover. We'll talk about how and why those things kind of correlate, but uh, very, very important in terms of what it is that God is revealing to us through these feasts. Again, we're not here to, to um, ritualize them like, uh, like the religious man or religious people tended to do, but really just to highlight their significance and their true meaning, both in Colossians chapter number two and several places in Hebrews, you find um, the Holy Spirit as Paul is writing these words to these, these Hebrew believers, as well as this church in Colossae, which, by the way, uh, doctrinally represents the last day's church, the age in which we live today. And we won't get into the whys, but uh, for now, just kind of take my word for it. Um, Paul is driving home the importance and the significance of these patterns or the shadows of things to come. And what you're going to see tonight is you're going to see through these seven uh, feasts of Israel or these seven feasts of the Lord in the Old Testament, how they relate to us in the New Testament. James is walking around with two handouts. Again, we're going to stay true to the dispensational chart that we know is God's plan. I want you to see where these... these um, mm -hmm. Where these feasts fit in uh, on the uh, on the timeline, not historically. We don't need to get into the history part because if you look at your chart, there's really just a couple bumps there. The big green bump where it says Israel, that's where they fit in historically. That's where the events played out. Most of the feasts, when God told the Israelites or, or when God told uh, Moses and the Levites to... To, to celebrate these feasts, to never forget these feasts, they came about because of an experience that they had. Those experiences or those events that happened, you find both in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers, right? For example, the Passover. Uh, why is it called the Passover? Who can remind me when we looked at that as one of the, of the um, uh, what was it? One of the seven somethings. In our study, which was, what was it when we looked at the Passover back, back a while back? The Lord's, no, it was somewhere in the in Bible study where it, where it came up in our discussion. The seven, seven mysteries, seven judgments. It was one, it was one of the, it was one of those. You guys, well, you guys know where they went, but. But let me ask you a question. The very first feast that we're going to see tonight is the Passover. And where and why does the Passover show up in the Bible? Who can remind me? Uh, the blood on the doorpost. That's right. Where did that happen, Gilbert, in the Bible? In Exodus chapter 12, right? And that was the key event that God used to finally. That was the straw that broke Pharaoh's back to finally uh, release, to let go of the children of Israel, to free them. Very significant, as you'll see tonight. That is found in Exodus chapter number 12. And you, you'll see in some of these charts that we provided for you tonight, especially the one that looks like a table, you'll mm -hmm. see where some of the events happened. Mm -hmm. 
from a historical standpoint, but again, it's going to be in Leviticus chapter number 23. Let me give you some context around Leviticus because the first five books in your Bible are known as the Pentateuch, also known as the books of Moses, also known as, as the Torah or the books of the law. The five books of Moses are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, right? That's profound. Numbers and Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books of Moses. It's in Exodus and in Numbers where you find the historical account of the events that played out during the Exodus, during that 40-year journey when the Israelites found themselves in the wilderness. That's where these stories and events play out. It's in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. I'm not even going to talk about Genesis because Genesis has its own unique little place as it reveals to us uh, God's plan for, um, for man as well as his people from Genesis 12 to Genesis 50 with, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 sons. So we're not going to get into that part of the story. We're getting into the part of the story when the Israelites left Egypt. So that part of the story is found in Exodus and in Numbers where Leviticus and Deuteronomy are very key and significant books that God used to bring and to shed light where he imposed rules and feasts and things to consider and memorialize and celebrate during that journey. So in those experiences that the children of Israel went through, as they went through something, God would say, all right, this was a significant event. Don't forget it. Mark it down. We're going to make a memorial out of it, for example. And hence the seven feasts. A lot of you that, um, that have Jewish friends or have Jewish relatives, um, or you may be, come from a Jewish background, a lot of Jewish people celebrate, quote, other feasts like Hanukkah or the Feast of Purim. Those are not part of the seven feasts. Those were historical events that happened in their history, but God never commanded them to keep them. By the way, Hanukkah, for example, doesn't even happen in any biblical historical context. That event happened between the Testaments, which is known as the silent period when the Greeks and the Romans were transitioning power in the Holy Land. Um, the Romans took control of the temple, obviously. Um, a Maccabean Jew by the name of uh, Maccabee um, led a revolt. They took control of the, the temple for eight days, hence the whole Hanukkah story. But there's nothing biblical about it. It's not a Jewish feast. However, Jesus does reference it in the Gospel of John chapter number 10 when he refers to the Feast of Lights. Or he calls, not the Feast of Lights, the Festival of Lights. And it was a reference, a direct reference to that historical account some 35 years prior known as the Maccabean Revolt. So I just want to give you some perspective because I figured somebody might be asking, what about Hanukkah um, and Adam Sandler and that really cool song on Saturday Night Live? Um, and um, the Feast of Purim is another feast that they keep to this day, which has to do with um, God using Esther to uh, save Israel from complete destruction when they were under um, Cyrus's and Haman's rule in the book of Esther. So just to kind of give you some perspective. So the seven feasts that we're going to be looking at very clearly and very explicitly are in that chart that looks like a table. Um, there's seven of them and there's going to be two major parts in which the, they break down. We're going to call them the spring feasts and the autumn feasts or the fall feasts. And that's how they break down. So historically, again, I want you to just give you a perspective because there's three applications to scripture always, right? And that's principle number, uh, that's principle number four of Bible study. If you look at your little booklet, principle number four, number four of Bible study is there's three applications to scripture, to the Bible. Look for, look for your rules or your principles of Bible study. And here are the three applications, historical. The historic application is what? That the Bible is a history book. Did you guys know that the Bible is the only quote, holy book? That is a history book, not the Hindu Vedas, not, not the Book of Mormon, not uh, the Quran. Any of those books don't provide the historical accounts and the historical accuracy that the Bible brings. So it's a history book. 
Secondly, we always talk about the devotional application, right? Who can remind me what that means? We know that it's a historical book. We know that it's a history book. There's a historical application to it. What is the devotional application or what we also call the inspirational? Leroy? I know you know. Inspirational. What does that mean? Tell us, Jorge. That's it. Plain and, plain, plain and simple. How does the word of God relate to you, right? There's these incredible historical accounts in the Bible. But again, if you really seek God out in prayer and meditation as you're reading those stories, God will always pop some profound, really cool principle that will apply to your life. I say this all the time. Not all the Bible is written to you, right? We know that. There's three groups of people, right? Right? Principle number two of Bible study. Three groups of people. Jew, Gentile, church. Not all the Bible's written to you, but all the Bible is written what? For you. What does that mean? Devotional application, inspirational application. That God provides light and he provides revelation, a principle that is relevant to you. I don't know if you guys notice this on Sundays, but when we're going through the book of Acts, I hope you're noticing this. Um, when we're going through the book of Acts, it's a very historical book. You're seeing very historical, profound historical events playing out in the history of the church, of how God is birthing the church. But I would be remiss if we just took that perspective, right? If we just focused on the history part and not make it relevant to our lives. So that is the balance that we try to bring when we present the gospel, when we present a message on a Sunday morning is you need to know how and what was playing out con contextually with the context of the, these events, but also know that the Bible applies to your life today. It has to matter. So now it brings us to the third application of Scripture, and that is the what? Doctrine. Doctrinal. Also known, a.k.a., also known as the prophetic. In other words, what is the specific teaching from a prophetic perspective that God is trying to drive home so that's what we're going to see tonight in these, um, in these feasts is you've got to understand historically that these events occurred and those events are going to play out in two places historically when they happen in Exodus or in Numbers. Now from a picture standpoint and God um, calling out Moses and Aaron saying, all right, now that you guys experience these events, I want you to memorialize them. We're going to call them feasts, God tells these guys. And through the priests, through the priesthood, the Levites, that's why these, that's why these, um, um, that's why these things are called, that's why they're showing up in Leviticus chapter 23. All seven feasts show up right there. In that one chapter, that whole chapter is dedicated to the feasts. So as God is telling Moses and Aaron to remember these events that played out in, in their history, which wasn't long history, just within those 40 years of the wilderness journey, these events that happened in, in Egypt with the Passover when God freed the Israelites to the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which happens roughly at the same time. He's saying, all right, now that you guys know about these, you experienced them, you live them, now let's not forget them. And he says, write these things down in chapter number 23 of this book known as the Book of, Levi, the book of Leviticus. So my question <clears throat> is, when underneath each uh, Levitical passage is another passage, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, what you're exactly what you're seeing there's going to be two references the actual account or the actual reference to the feast in leviticus chapter 23 and then the one below it is where the event occurred okay that's why i put them in that order so you know where it shows up because tonight our text and your proof text this brings us to principle number nine i believe it is or are you there doreen which principle stocks to the proof text or, or the principle of full mention? I think it's nine, is it not? Six. Six, the principle of full mention. This is your proof text for the feasts. Chapter 23. 
So those of you that are, you've, you've still got your really cool Catholic calendars from Guadalupe Church, when you start flipping through those pages and you see the Passover and you see all these Jewish feasts for showing up, even in your Catholic calendar, now you know where to go in the Word of God to get what it is that God was trying to really teach us about these feasts. Uh, so a little bit of sarcasm there. I apologize, but not really. Um, so... Uh, let's back up a little bit now. Again, take you back to this chart, which is the seven dispensational chart, because everything that we try to reveal to you guys and make known to you guys, we can never lose sight of the fact that we are bound to this plan that God has established in his word. That's why there's a little subtitle in there called God's plan for the ages. The important thing, I was having lunch with this gentleman today who um, was involved in the Unitarian Church, a very spiritual guy. And I said, you know what? I appreciate what you've been taught, what's been revealed to you, and the fact that you have this, this spirituality that you want to embrace. But what good is all that if you don't really know where you fit in to some purpose or some plan? And once I shared that, I saw him kind of just stop in his tracks and really ponder what I said. He goes, when can we have lunch again? <laughs> and I said, as long as you buy whenever. Um, no, I didn't say that, Tim. I was kidding. But you know what? That's what we want to do in people's lives is we want to challenge them to think. And once I kind of threw this notion out, this idea out to him about prophetically, this is why these these prophetic overviews are so significant because you have to understand where it fits in, where you fit in. So the word of God begins to make sense and his plan makes sense. His plan for the, for the universe, his plan for this planet and his plan for your lives. And part of that includes a timeline because that's what we're going to talk briefly about tonight is a bit of a timeline, right? Everything fits in a timeline somewhere, whether it be the seven mysteries, the seven judgments, the seven resurrections, even the seven feasts are about a timeline. Look at your little diagram thing again. Could I get one of these, James? Again, if you look at this thing, we broke it down into, <clears throat> into spring and fall feasts. That's where they fall in. They, they, there's, there's four of them that fall in the spring and three in the fall. What are, these, what are these things called? What are spring and fall usually referred to? Seasons. Seasons, right? You know what Paul said to the Thessalonians somewhere in Thessalonians? I think it's chapter four somewhere. <laughs> so we're, and I think it's in my notes. Turn to, yeah, chapter five. He says this to them. He says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And there's, he's telling this to some believers. These, the times and the seasons, there's no need for me to write unto you. Look what he says next. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You know what he just said to them in that verse? Because of my word, because of my plan being laid out in my word, you ought to know when I'm coming back. Because this very spiritually significant guy that I was having lunch with today who really embraces his spirituality, and I said, that is awesome. You just need to balance your spirituality with truth now, and you're going to be good to go. Now he's got curious about his future. Really, what is life about? So this is what Paul is saying to us in this verse is man, what good is your existence or your religion if it's about you and you feeling good and you experiencing your little nirvana thing and becoming a Buddhist and going through life just chanting and humming and whatever you do to feel better. No, this ain't about you. It's not about me. It's about his glory and a life of purpose that brings glory to his name, knowing and realizing that he's coming back someday to establish his kingdom that you and I get to be a part of. So... That's what I love about the fact that God is a God of order. He's got, he's, we serve and we worship a God who's got a plan. And that plan includes you and me. How cool is that? So these are feasts. And Paul talks about the times and the, there's the times. There's your times and the what? Seasons, spring and fall. And that's how you'll see this awesome breakdown and uh, I'm going to throw this next slide out because this has kind of been our, our little bit of our catch-all, if you will. This is where the seven dispensations relate to the seven feasts. No, one through seven again. And you're going to see and you're going to track these 
we're not going to spend a lot of time in this because I really want to hang out and camp out with this chart, which is going to be really, really key tonight. You get this down, these feasts you'll never forget and they'll really begin to make sense for you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be cool. It's going to be profound. But I want you to see again, just to be consistent on how we've been doing things, I want you to see where they fit in and the significance of where and why they fit where they fit. Okay? The first four again, being very, look at the chart. Being very what? If you look at that chart. What do you think? Thank you, Larry. Very church-centric. My question is, what is the difference between one, two, and three versus five, six, and seven? What's the significance of five, six, and seven? Look at the chart on the screen and then look at your table. What's the significance of five, six, and seven? If one is very church-centric, what do you think the last three are very centric, George? Israel. Very Israel-centric. Again, three groups of people rightly divide the word of truth. The spring, you know, we are always debate and discuss, is Jesus coming in the spring or in the fall? I believe to this day because not just because of number three, but also because of the Song of Solomon, that springtime is the day or the season for the rapture because it's a church-centric event. Shoot, it could be this spring. We got till June 21st, man. It could happen. <laughs> Some crazy things happening right now in the world. I was, they were just sharing with me about some stuff going on in the Golan Heights and Monday, this Monday, 70 years. Could it be? Could it be? Maybe. And it happened. God chose to let maybe the, me, everybody look up here. No, look at your chart. Down here. Five and six. That little, that little sub timeline there right here. What does it say? Time of, Jacob's trouble. Time of Jacob's trouble. What does that imply? Look at the parentheses. Tribulation, Tribulation period. Some events are going to have to play out. Prophetically, I'm not talking historically feasts, but prophetically, that fall in line with the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement and their prophetic significance and what they mean. Are you tracking a little bit? Good. It's not complicated people complicate this stuff god's very ex explicit and very clear in how and what it is that he wants to communicate to it. so again good observation on two people's parts the seat the spring the spring feast very church centric and you're going to see why the fall feast very israel and very jewish centric and you're going to see why the first four feasts the the feasts that we're going to be looking at uh, on the spring side, guess what? Look at their chart again. If we are living here doctrinally, just before the rapture happens, right? Say, let's assume we're right there. Say the rapture is going to, let's just, for argument's sake, or no argument's sake, that the rapture is going to happen tomorrow or tonight. And so we're living right there. Look at where these things reside. Are you with me? That's where they're all at. What does that imply? What does it imply? Look at that. Church age, yes, but I'm looking for a specific word or a phrase, concept. They've already happened. They've happened. Right? They've happened. One, you, when the day that you guys accepted Christ as Savior. Two, you're going to talk about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You know what the, you'll see what it speaks to? Living a holy life. You hear me talk about position, condition all the time? Becoming Christ-like? Feast of Unleavened Bread. Number three is what? The Feast of? First Fruits. That's your resurrection. We talked about that last week. Look where that number three shows up. And then number four, kind of jump backwards a little bit. That's where the Holy Spirit came. Pentecost. Pentecost is the bridge between those two seasonal feasts. That chart is so key. And then the other three, they're yet to happen. I don't understand why three is off to the right, off the left. I don't understand that. Resurrection. Oh. Your resurrection. Oh, 
Jesus, because of Jesus' resurrection, you too will be resurrected. We saw that last week, right? Resurrection number one was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Remember, we were talking even on Sunday. Chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter. The first 18, 19 verses of chapter 15 focus on Jesus' resurrection. And because of his resurrection, we too are resurrected. You are resurrected first spiritually, the day that you got saved. You become that spiritual being. That was my discussion with that gentleman today, is that you are a spiritual being. I'm glad you serve, but it's not spiritual because you're not a spiritual being because you like to go and hum on top of Santa Fe Baldy or whatever. You're spiritual because the Holy Spirit indwelled you. Number four, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and indwelled the believers. You're not spiritual because of some religion that you're adhering to. You're spiritual because of who God is inside of you. Having said that, that now leads us to your bodily resurrection, which is the last part of chapter number 15, the mystery of you being transformed, right? First Corinthians 15, he talks about the mystery of the rapture of the church in the last few verses of first Corinthians 15. Number three, that's your bodily resurrection. Of course. Good. Look, look at your chart. Look at your chart. I put the gospel right inside your chart. Which is the the second row, maybe. The second row. The second row below the header. There's the gospel. It, what you just said is in the chart. Exactly. You're right. Every Everything. That's why that cross is the major milestone in that chart. Again, context. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Context, I want you to see events. This is like, a, like how it relates to the events that are going to play out. Right, you are bodily resurrected. Why? Because of Christ's resurrection. And that happened three days after the cross, right? Because of his resurrection, you too are going to be resurrected. But when are you completely resurrected? Not the day you got saved. You were spiritually resurrected, as we saw last week. You're going to be bodily resurrected at the rapture. That's why I showed it there. If that makes sense. So how many years is the period? What do you think? Um, well, if it, if it's between Pentecost and Trumpets, um, what are you right now? Look at the chart. What's the, it so it begs the question, it begs the question, what's the time gap between oh. that event there and that event there? 2000, 2000 years. Thank you. Okay. This is why. We lose sight of these truths. This is, gets us to some of those pattern, those pattern rules where, where, uh, where Jesus and we talk about the word of God and the terms in the Bible being significant. There's a reason why Jesus rose again on the third day. Everybody turn to John chapter 2, the wedding at Canaan. I want you to see, uh, this, these are great questions because now you're, you're connecting dots. Leroy, read chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Jesus' first miracle, by the way. John 2, verses 1 and 2. Leroy. No, John. The Gospel of John. If you can see that fine print. Stop. On what day? Third day. Not the fourth day, not the second, not the first. The third day. Who, uh, what else happened on the third day? What else happened? Think, say it loud, Jim. Christ resurrected. What's the significance of a marriage on the third day? Guess what? After the rapture, you're going to be in a wedding. See how the Bible works? Yeah. Why? One day with Second Peter 3, 8. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Okay. Everybody look up here. Day one, halfway. Day two, day three. 
See how it works? That's how the Bible works. This is why those verses are profound. So when God said, when God created the planet in six days, or not created the planet, his creation in six days and rested on the seventh. You know what he did in those, in those six days? He could have done it in a split second. He's God. But he chose to give us a timeline because he had this in mind. He had a timeline in mind when he created hit what he did and when, when he did what he did in those six days and rested on the seventh. You know what that seventh day of rest is? The millennium, number seven. That's the real Sabbath. When I showed the Sabbath to those two Jewish guys prophetically, that it was actually Jesus coming back and establishing his kingdom for a thousand years, they were blown away. They absolutely had never heard that before. That's the real Sabbath. But what have they done? What do religions do? They make that day holy and we set rules and conditions and impose this and impose that on people to, quote, keep the Sabbath. You can hear it from Christians. Sunday is the Sabbath. Baloney. There's no such thing as a Christian Sabbath. Now, the first day of the week should be our day of rest where our focus is completely on God and coming together and being together. That's Book of Acts stuff. Both in 1 Corinthians 16 and in Acts chapter 20, you see a huge change in the church where they're no longer meeting on the Sabbath and in synagogues. Now they're meeting on the first day of the week in churches. That's when you see the transition really happen. So that's why we meet on the first day of the week. It's biblical. But it's not our Sabbath. A Sabbath was something that the Jews were kept, were told to keep for a specific reason, which really refers to that last day, the seventh day known as the millennium. Friday to Saturday, the last day of the week. That's the last day of the week. Are you with me? See that? that was under, the law. under the law. But a Jew, a practicing Jew today, is always going to be under the law. Because <laughs> they, all they have is an Old Testament. Right? So, believe me, they're living Leviticus yeah. to this day. If you're a good Jew. Yeah. What about like the uh, those are wannabe Jews. <laughs> That's what I call them. All the cults are just wannabes. Wannabes. And there's a whole other group today in our midst. We, we, there's this Hebrew roots movement that you guys should be mindful and aware of because it's growing huge in northern New Mexico. But uh, wannabe Jews. There's the real Israel. And then there's the church. This is what makes us what we are in terms of a church that believes in dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. You have to draw those distinctions or you're going to get jacked up in your theology it's really pretty simple rightly dividing the word of truth how do you rightly divide the word of truth three groups of people jew gentile church um three applications historical doctrinal inspirational number principle number two number three is the principle of time right the importance of time and timelines that god is has, has got a plan in place and all those rules, those first four, help you get to number one, which is what? Context. And you know why we have Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses and wannabe Jews? Because they take things out of context. And when you take things out of context because you're not applying those principles, start your own religion. And we were talking about that on Sunday. Denominations, right? What does denomination mean? Come on, you people means to divide. Denominator is the divider. Denominations divide people. But there's some fundamental truths that we could never ever compromise on is who is Jesus and what is his plan and all these other things of conviction. How does this plan play out? Look at your chart. You find the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection in the first three feasts. You can't escape the gospel anywhere in God's word. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. Historically, when did he die? The Passover. The lamb had to be, the lamb's blood had to be shed. He was buried how? 
When we're, we're to be buried. When we baptize people buried in the likeness of his death. Why do we teach that? Romans chapter 5 and 6. You are to die to self. Somebody turn to, Larry, turn to Galatians chapter 2. Verse number 20. I want her to read this really loud. This is a great verse that speaks of how we are to live this life. I love this verse. Galatians 2.20. Loud. There's, there's one. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you catch that? You're crucified. You want to live in this life? Know what it means to crucify you. That's... What the, that's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about. A holy walk. Sanctification, we call it, right? We were using the term justified on Sunday, right? Justification is also another reference to salvation. Guess when that happened? At the cross, Passover, right? Because of the fact now, and this is what this gentleman couldn't understand today, was he didn't grasp the fact that he thought being holy was just being holy in his own way, in his own mind, in his own new age way, his own Unitarian way. No, holiness can only come from Christ. You have no power on your own to be holy for all have sinned and come short of God's glory, right? So what makes us holy? The fact that he lives inside you, the fact that he indwells you, because of that, you have the power to walk a life of righteousness, of holy. Whether you do that or not is your choice. So the choices that you make matter and the choices that you make are going to be affected by what you take into your mind and what you allow to get into your heart, which affects your will, your choices, your decisions in life, which leads you to number three, which is now you are looking at the feast of first fruit, which speaks of what? Your redemption, your, not your resurrection, your, your resurrection, both spiritually and which happens the day that you get saved and bodily, which happens when we get what? Thank you, Jim. You're getting it. Awesome, you guys. Isn't that simple? Pretty simple, huh? So I think we're done. Any questions? No. What's what? Resurrection. So what's Pentecost? Pentecost is extremely unique. You, Pentecost is unique because what I didn't give you on this chart, and I'm not going to be apologetic about it, but I will try to create one at some point. Maybe we'll put it in the book. I'll have George help me with it. But what you don't see there, except for the bottom part where it says time of Jacob's trouble, are some time intervals that you need to see. But there's a 50-day interval known as the known as the Jubilee between the first fruits feast and Pentecost. There was this gap of time. If you go back and get your calendar from Guadalupe, you will find the Feast of First Fruits on one of those days on that calendar. And then you'll find Pentecost pop up somewhere in your 50 days later in your calendar. That was Pentecost. What was the significance of Pentecost? By the way, the word Pentecost is not a, uh, it's not a, a Old Testament term. It's not a Jewish term. It's a Greek term. So you only find it in the New Testament in Acts chapter two specifically. But it's implied in Leviticus chapter number three and verses uh, 23 verses 15 through 22. That's where it's implied. And it's nothing more than um, God telling these guys to keep these things. And, and this is how it was. This was how it was laid out. They were the, the Levitical priest was told to take two loaves of bread Two loaves of bread. Why two? Anybody have any idea? And wave them. Good job. You're an amazing woman. Everybody, take your Bibles. Take your Bibles and turn with me. Everybody, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Who wants to read it? Go ahead, Gilbert. Read it loud. First Corinthians 12? Yes. yes. No, 13. Verse 13. 
Here's your proof text for what Ms. Jan Clemens just said, which was spot on. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Stop right there. By one spirit, which is who? The Holy Spirit. When did he come? Pentecost. Pentecost. Right? Are you with me? So Paul is writing this some 30 years later after the Pentecost experience in Acts chapter 2. He's writing this letter to the Corinthians. Go ahead, Gilbert. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. There you go. The two loaves. That's what you find God telling these Jews to do in both in Leviticus 23 and in Exodus 29. Take, all right, Levi priests, take these two loaves of bread and wave them. And God was setting the stage for, I don't give a flip. God is saying, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, we're all one in Christ. We're seeing that in the book of Acts, right? Remember in the early part of the book of Acts on our Sunday morning study, how there was all these push, all this pushback by the Jew, by the Jewish believers, by the early church guys. No, the Gentiles can't come to Christ. Peter wouldn't even sit down and have a meal with Cornelius. How dare you? He was called out by his fellow Jewish friends. How dare you go sit with these dirty dog Gentiles? And right there, once this transition is complete, which is what you find when you, Paul writes Corinthians, he said, it doesn't matter. Yeah. This whole thing, Pentecost, is a profound thing. And you know what God did? He bridged the gap. He brought Jews and Gentiles together and created this incredible thing called the church. Yes, it was. Yes. And we know that why. What is leaven or what is leaven? I was asking James that tonight. What's leaven? Anybody know? It's yeast. It's yeast. It's a, a foreign substance introduced to pure bread. And this is why you see in uh, the second column, the second feast, the feast of unleavened bread. God says, don't put any leaven in the bread because a little leaven, Paul said, leaven it the whole lump and leaven is something, it's an artificial riser yeast to make the bad bread grow. And you know what you've seen in the church age after Pentecost? A lot of bad doctrine. A lot of bad theology. Leaven has leavened the whole lump, even a little leaven. In um, the book of Matthew, I forget, Larry, find that part for me where, where um, the... Where Jesus calls, talks about the kingdom of heaven likened to three measures of meal. Just, just uh, search for measures of meal. There's three types of um, there's three types of leaven. That's not the right. No, three types of meal that become leavened. Did you know that in Christendom, there's three leavened forms of religion out there. In Christendom, there's three what I would say leavened or three major systems of religion that call itself Christian that has leaven in their doctrine or bad theology. The Roman church, the Eastern church and the Protestant churches. And this is why he likens this woman. Did you find it, Larry? Matthew 14, I think. The three measures of meal. Measure of measures of meal. Those are the three. It's look at three measures. Anyway, that's your text where prophetically Jesus is talking about, hey man, in this thing called the church age, there's going to be the pure word and the pure doctrine. That's what I like to believe that we're about. But there's also going to be these religious systems out there that are going to happen historically. It only took 300 years for that to happen. Boom. Read it loud. Yes, there you go. The, who's the woman? Who's that? Who's that woman? You know what? You were talking. No, it's not that woman. Who's the woman? I'm right. We talked about her today. That's her. That's her. That's where it started. The Roman system. The Roman church launched it because she's the first of the three measures, right? She's created in 325 A.D., Another 200 years later, the Eastern Orthodox Church, there's a split between the Eastern and the Western Church. We know it today as Eastern Orthodoxy, right? Everybody know about the Eastern Orthodox Church? There's a church up here called Saint something or another on Cordova. 
St. Benedictine or something. There's another one in El Dorado, that white building on the hill. Eastern Orthodox, they do not adhere to anything Roman Catholic in terms of who they follow and they hold themselves accountable. They have their own set of popes. There's seven of them. They're called patriarchs. There's the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, all the, anything that has to do with the Eastern Orthodox Church. There was a split. So the Western Church, their headquarters was Rome. The Eastern Church was what? Constantinople, also known today as Istanbul. Istanbul. There's a huge cathedral in downtown Istanbul. It used to be a cathedral. It's a museum slash mosque today known as the San Sofia. That was the headquarters. That was the Vatican of the Eastern Church. There it still is to this day. The main patriarch in the Eastern Orthodox Church is in Istanbul. Under the guise in a very Islamic country, a country that's getting more and more Islamic every single day. Um, I believe that he's going to get in bed with them, Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey, because he's in bed with the Russians and the Russians are the keepers of Eastern Orthodoxy. If you notice, Putin just got, um, what is it that we do on January 20th whenever we have a president? What's that thing called? Inauguration. inauguration. He just had his inauguration yesterday. And guess who blessed him? The patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. He's getting religious. He used to be a communist atheist just a few years ago. See how religion's playing an interesting part here in the last days and the end times? Isn't the Bible cool? So, Roman, Eastern Orthodox, in 1052 BC, AD, it became known as the Great Schism, and there was a conflict, and that's where the church split into the Eastern Church and the Roman Church, and then 500 years later, 1517 we know it as the reformation the protestant the protestant the, the protestant reformation luther gets up a roman catholic priest sees all the corruption in rome says i'm sick and tired of being sick and tired i don't this pope guy is crooked he's corrupt goes back to his hometown of wittenberg germany nails the 98 point thesis on the wittenberg cathedral and starts what we know today as the protestant reformation or the protestant movement Lutherans being first, then behind them were the Presbyterians up in Scotland, then the Methodists also from England, and then later on the Anglican Church, what we know today as the Episcopalians, when Henry VIII told the Pope to go fly a kite when he was trying to get him to marry Anne Boleyn. He says, no, I'm going to marry whoever I want because I'm king, started his own religion. We know it today as the Anglican Church or the Episcopal Church, which is also the and you know who's in charge of that? Not the, not the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the Queen. This is why they're going to be making a big deal whenever this, when's this silly wedding going to happen? When? I said, who cares? I know. I, 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 that's why I'm asking. I don't even know what happened. I know there's a wedding and guess what? That is the Anglican. That is the Anglican church. So all you see, and here's, here's. Here's what I'm getting at. If every one of us, if every one of us in this room would say to, on Sunday, ah, eh, let's not, or the next several Sundays, ah, eh, let's quit going to John's boring sermons about the book of Acts. Let's go visit the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church in town, the Presbyterian Church, and the Roman Catholic Church. You know what you'd see? A mass. A very similar mass with a little change here, a little change there. But at the end of the day, it all came from, I keep pointing at Michelle because we were having this discussion before Bible study. It all, it, all came from one, this, it all came from one woman. The woman of Revelation chapter 17. Yes, the Roman church. The most powerful system on the planet, by the way. Extremely powerful. So that was a little bit of a sidebar. I have no clue what that has to do with feasts. But no, I know what it did. It's profound because... Yeah, we were talking about leaven. That's right. So I'm kind of doing kind of an overview, just kind of throwing stuff at you. But again, if you look at the third row, not the title thing, but where it says uh, the believers, the believers redemption happened at the Passover, right? The believers walk speaks of the feast of unleavened bread. And then the third one is the believers resurrection. First Corinthians chapter 15, which is the feast of 
first fruits. So you see all that played out. The last column, the bottom row, I'm sorry, not column, but row, are the actual Jewish calendar months that you see. I don't know if you know this about the Jewish calendar, but they don't adhere to the Gentile calendar, which we're a part of. Our month, our first month starts in January, which is winter time. Their first month starts at Passover. That, that, the Passover is the 14th day of the first year. So on the Jewish calendar, the first month of their year is known as the month of Nisan. So on the Jewish calendar, as it relates to our calendar, the Jewish calendar would have started in March. No, not March, middle of March, because on the 14th day this year is when they celebrate the Passover. Are you with me? So that's what those things are. I just want you to know. So if you guys want to Google Jewish calendar and, and see how it maps out, this is how you're going to see. And this is why these show up in the spring. Because again, God using the Jewish people from a very spiritual and biblical perspective, we know that springtime is what? Seasonally, new beginnings. Everything comes to life. So it's no coincidence because there's never coincidence in God's plan that the year for a Jew would begin in March or in the springtime. Are you with me? So then you can track to and there's 12 other months or 10 other months that you don't see on there. So when you get to the fall feast, you find the months of Tishri and these are the days, the first day, 10th day, 15th through the 22nd day for these other feasts. The fall, okay, everybody look at the gap. And I'm not talking about the gap in Genesis 1. But I'm talking about this gap. See this gap here? Yep. That is those 2,000 years. Those are those 2,000 years. Yeah. Okay. So um, in uh, some of uh, um, in, in the book of Daniel and in other places like that, you find the term. And I don't think I put it up there, but it's also known as the interval. But never forget, again, if you look at the seven mysteries that we, that we studied several weeks ago, the church is a mystery to the world. It's a unique dispensation. There's no other period in the history of mankind like the church age. These 2,000 years are so profound. Not even, the, not even the Jewish prophets saw the church age coming, which is really fascinating. We've seen that in... Isaiah 9, 6 and other places like that where all they can see was a, a Jewish line, if you will. So once the church age is over, now you're looking at what we call the fall feast. And again, if you look at the little subtitle, um, the subheader where it says the spring feast, the first four were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. The last three, the fall feasts, are going to be fulfilled at Jesus' second coming which are yet to happen, right? Prophetically. So are you with me? Yeah. It's the gather... Stop which everybody just stop and not Jan Clemens. I want you to say it loud and clear. Gathering the, harvest. the harvest it's harvest time. Think about that prophetically. What are the first fruits, right? The first fruits are, is that feast in the early spring, right? And there's three phases to a harvest. And you see this in first Corinthians. Hey, farmer boy from Milwaukee. No, do they? No, you were a dairy farmer so that you wouldn't know. But there's. <laughs> <laughs> this he knows not this but listen there's three yeah <laughs> that's drinking milk i hope yeah not old not old milwaukee okay listen up you guys are getting out of hand here there's three phases to every harvest right there's the first fruits, which is exactly what it implies the first fruits guess what you have the privilege of being part of god's first fruits then what's the second phase of a harvest of the fall stuff anybody know no i'm talking we're talking about harvesting 
It's called what? It's called the harvest or the gathering. The main harvest. And if you go back to the book of Ruth, which is a great book prophetically between Christ and the church, when, when, when during harvest time, Boaz told his servants to leave behind what? The gleanings. The gleanings. So you have the first fruits, you have the harvest, you have the gleanings. And the gleanings is that remnant in the tribulation period that God will save. We know him as the tribulation period saints. So that is significant. So that's why God puts them in the harvest because you know what he's doing? He's getting ready, man, to bring forth his return. He's preparing the world for his imminent return. Everybody look at the chart. So the first of the four feasts in the fall is the Feast of Trumpets. And what you need to be mindful of, if you look at your chart, and this is why you put it, not this chart, but the dispensational one, this is why we put it here. Why did we put it there? Anybody have any clue why we put it there? No. The God is gathering. He's gathering his people. He's gathering. The, the trumpet has, is blowing. It's Man, next week is profound, folks. 19, 1917 was key when the Balfour Declaration happened. 1948 was even more significant when they finally, when finally we were able to see the, the name Israel on a map for the first time in 2,000 years. Now you're seeing these geopolitical things playing out like the U.S. only being one of three countries on the entire planet that even acknowledges those green lines, choosing to move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the eternal city. Strategic. Yes, I saw on the news where they're hanging signs that are pointing both in English and in Hebrew, U.S. Embassy in downtown. I'm not sure where the building is. We'll see it when we're there, I'm sure. But... It's cool stuff that's happening. So you're seeing this gathering. We saw that last week. If you remember, I don't know if you got your resurrection chart, but one of the seven resurrections was the resurrection of the nation of Israel. God never, ever, you need to get this folks, ever, ever, uh, is never, ever going to fail from keeping the promises. Look at where the, the green line begins. Where does that green line begin? Dispensation number what? Number four. What's dispensation number four called? Promise. When did that happen in, in, historically in the Bible? What, what, what book and chapter? Genesis. Thank you, Leroy. Good job. You guys are getting this. I love it. Genesis 12. What did, what did God do in Genesis 12? He called Abraham aside and he says, all right, I'm going to create a great nation through you guys. And he, not only that, he promised to, to, to create this great nation but he's also going to give them a piece of geography, a piece of land on this planet. We've talked about the boundaries of the Garden of Eden. That's really where they are. It's what we know today as the Fertile Crescent. It's what we know today as what, what Obama referred to as ISIL or the, the, uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant includes that, that, that promised land. And he promised it both to, to, uh, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 in Genesis chapter 24 to, to Isaac and in chapter 30 somewhere, he promises it to Jacob. The same exact boundaries. It's about the land. So when you go prophetically to your Bible, as we saw last week, over here, if you look up at the chart, look what shows up here. What chapter? What was the significance of Ezekiel 37? Actually, 36. Check this out. 36, 37, and 38. Those three chapters together. What's the significance of Ezekiel 36? God's prophetic, God's prophetic promise to Israel of the land. In other words, I'm going to give you the land back. Prophetically, future-wise. What happens in chapter 37? The valley of, the valley of dry bones. What does that imply? What is he talking about? He's bringing Israel back into the land. 
You can't put the cart before the horse. You can't, you got to have a place for people to go. Isn't it interesting that God established the land through the Balfour Declaration, right? He says, all right, the Brits and the Americans and the Australians defeat the Ottoman Turks in the Middle East, kick the Turks out. Brits control the land now. This British parliamentarian was influenced by a guy named Hendrickson and, and Theodore Herzl. The, the land is established. Zionism is created. Now the Jews have a place to go. How big was that then, John? Um, everything except the Golan Heights, the West, what is it, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip today. Very small strip. Very small. Yeah. So if you take a look at a modern day map, the of Palestine? Yeah, the it is Palestine. The world calls it Palestine. I call it Israel. Yeah. Yeah. That's why the Palestinians want it back. Right. So here's what people don't understand. And you guys need to understand this. There's never been a Palestinian state. Never has been. That, that, that was a God thing. That was God providentially protecting his eternal city and his eternal places. That little strip today. That strip, that promised land is much greater than what you see in a modern day map that is called Israel. It's going to extend all the way up into Syria, all the way up into Jordan, all the way up into Iraq, and all the way down to the Persian Gulf. That's the promised land. What's really confusing is American Jews are taking sides with Palestinians. No, not all of them. All Liberal ones will. All, but a lot of them. Yes, Reformed Jews, Reformed Jews will. Because Reformed Jews are more about left-wing agendas versus if you go there some of the most some of the most zionist and and you need to draw a distinction between a biblical perspective of god remember we're talking about the fig tree the fig tree is blind israel that is pride for israel there's the olive tree israel that's going to have its spiritual eyes back that was the promise if you look up here you're going to see um Romans chapter number 11. See it where Israel is restored? The gathering and then Israel is restored. You know where you find that restoration in the New Testament? In Romans chapter 11 where Paul says, hey man, don't be a knucklehead Christians. Don't, let, don't be ignorant in your own conceit about who you think you are. Although you know that the church is awesome and it's a cool thing to be a part of, I'm going to keep my promises to Israel. That's what he's saying to us in Romans 11. That's what he's driving home in that text. So that's going to be spiritual Israel. This is where the fig tree is going to be replaced with olive branches and olive oil and all the cool stuff that God promised the Jews way back as Leroy suggested in Genesis chapter 12. It's going to happen. It's happening. So the trumpets, the feast of trumpets, which is the first feast in the fall is this regathering, this calling back of his people, which you see in, in Revelation chapter, I'm sorry, in Ezekiel chapter 37. The gathering happens. This is why we show it where we show it on that chart as they're making their way back into the land. And then you get to number seven. And this is why at the very bottom of this chart, I connected those first two major feasts prophetically to what we call the book of Revelation. You have to be here next week as we look at Daniel's 70th week to really get a good grasp and a good perspective of this, that, this Jacob's trouble thing. We're going to talk about Daniel's 70th week and the tribulation period. Those things are going to play out because although God is gathering Israel today, they're still wearing what? The fig leaf. They're prideful. They rejected Christ. They still don't acknowledge Jesus. They're blinded in part, Paul says in Romans chapter 11. Well, guess what? Those scales of their eyes are going to be removed ultimately in, Revela in the book of Revelation when God reveals them. You know when he reveals him? Feast of Atonement. Look at the second row. The what? What does it say? Look at your chart. The king returns to do what? To just hang out? going to come back because he just wants to come back yeah he's going to set up his scheme he's going to atone for their sins the sins of the people you see that in Zechariah chapter number 13 verses 1 and 2 I love the book of Zechariah go hang out in the book of Zechariah because that speaks of Jesus' return and all that he's going to do in setting up his kingdom so when you get to chapter number 13 man he's atoning for all the nonsense that they did Listen, look at this. 
from here to here. For the last, listen to me, 4,000 years after he allowed them to become his people. The whole Feast of Atonement is for them to atone for their sins. And then the last and final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is his kingdom reign. God sets up his kingdom on this planet. You know, what you know what's crazy? These Jews that we know in our, that are friends of ours, that are neighbors of ours, that live in Israel and all this other stuff, they celebrate these things with absolutely having no clue of what they really mean prophetically. Feast of Tabernacles, that's the thousand year reign, man. The messianic kingdom age. For a thousand years, Jesus rules on the planet and his tabernacle has made it and has become our tabernacle. He's going to dwell. We're going to dwell with him. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. A couple thoughts also that you might not be aware of. Um, the Feast of Trumpets is also known as the, um, hold on, it's in my notes. I just forgot it. I just spaced out for some reason. Um, it's also known as, as Rosh Hashanah. You guys have heard that term. For those of you that have a Jewish calendar at home instead of a Catholic one, you'll see that on the calendar, Rosh Hashanah. And the one in the feast and the atonement feast is also known as what? Yom Kippur, right? Also happens to be the holiest day in Jewish, on the Jewish calendar. Why? Because they're atoning for the sins and they don't even realize it that their sins have already been atoned at the cross. No, Jesus is. I know, but you said uh, they, they, the Jews um, celebrate Yom Kippur. Yes, because celebrate. They celebrate Yom Kippur. I you, I you it's like all your atheist friends that celebrate Christmas yeah. or Easter and have no clue what it really means. We were talking about that earlier. Easter to the world is what? Easter bunnies and rabbits and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. Having no clue of what it really means, right? That's where deception and paganism and nonsense has made its way into whatever jews do the same thing jews are celebrating feasts that ha they have no clue of their significance think of the passover and the significance of the passover and what really transpired there where the shed blood of the lamb was shed and the, the shed the blood is what covered their household from that death angel coming over and passing over they they know historically what happened they know traditionally or religiously what it means, but do they know spiritually what Jesus? This is why you see First Corinthians chapter. Um, uh, it's not on there, but First Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen, where Paul refers to Jesus as our what Passover Lamb, our Passover. Jesus was our Passover. Yes. That's a good question. That I don't. That I don't know. You're talking about. Um, you're talking of what's his name? Uh, Revelation chapter number sixteen. Uh, um, say again. Apollyon. Yeah. That's his Greek name. There's also a Hebrew name for him. Abaddon. Yeah. That I don't know. I, I I would think not, but I don't know. I don't know. But it. But. Uh, a good question. I don't know. There's got to be a connection. So, you were, I have not, you know, we were, we were hoping and we were trying to be intentional on the, the, the Israel trip to go during the feast. And Jim Mart said, you don't want to be here during the feast because it's crazy. It's expensive. It's hectic. So to answer your question, no, I would love to see them sometime. They're huge, especially when you go to the Western wall during the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Isn't it interesting that in that holiest day in 1972, what happened in 72 on Yom Kippur? 73. Was it 73? Yeah. The Muslims attacked, yeah. knowing that the Jews were going to be focusing on some very spiritual things. And yeah, it, yeah, surprise. But God being God, just turned that thing back as well. Uh, so that was known as yeah. the war. It, it was a, another Muslim attack on Israel. In 73, known as the Yom Kippur War, the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, 
73? Yeah. So another, another important fact, second coming, second coming of Christ. Again, God being consistent. Um, those of you who choose to believe that Jesus was born on uh, December 25th, you keep living out your pagan ways and have at it. But I believe that he was born on that day. More than likely on the 21st or 22nd of September, which is this Feast of Tabernacles, which is, again, a picture of his second return. Again, God being God, you know that the shepherds were out in their fields when Gabriel shows up and he begins proclaiming Jesus. Typically at wintertime, the shepherds would have their animals stocked up. So there's a lot of indicators, indicators or indications that Jesus was born in the fall and not in the wintertime. We won't get into the whole Baal and Baal worship and the winter feast and all that it represents and what Christ, Christmas brings. Go look at Ezekiel chapter 5 and chapter 10 sometime if you want to get some perspective of what that winter festival pagan stuff is really about. I don't want to blow your Christmas. Don't be calling your Christmas tree a Baal pole or anything stupid like that. Use those things as opportunities to talk about Jesus and share Jesus. I'm not telling you to throw your Easter eggs at your grandma or whatever. Don't be